we have any MFOs in the audience? Okay. Excellent. Uh, Taking off, Jerry. Good. Yeah. So I'm very, very happy to introduce to you Gary Goff. Good. Thank you. Um, It's interesting. So the title of this talk is Growing Trees in a Deer Environment. And, and in uh, the agenda, I see, I, I'm not sure whether I'm supposed to be uh, talking more about trees or more about deer or which one I'm supposed to be favoring one way or the other because it is a balancing act. If, if you have too many deer, your trees will suffer. And, and if you, uh, I won't say if you have too many trees, your deer will suffer. But it's a balancing act of how you manage that ecosystem. It's all said and done. So another way of saying this is growing deer in a tree environment. You could go that way. And, and I, I have actually two different talks. You know, all about subculture where trees are your primary interest. You know, trees are it. Trees are more, better, whatever. And then there's obviously people that want you know, back with trees. I want more, bigger, better deer. And inexorably, they're they're connected, and, and that's the conundrum of giving this talk. So, just for just for the fun of it, let's have a show of hands. Generally speaking, where you live, do you believe there are too many deer or, or too few deer? So we'll start with how many people think you have too many deer? Raise your hand. Ooh. Okay. How many people think you have too few deer? <laughs> few people. All right. Well. Scattered across New York State, and their inventory 
Um, they used to be inventory every 10 years, now 10% of them are in inventory every year. I believe that's how that goes. And um, so they inventory, you know, what's in the understory, what, what we got for regeneration, and they came up with the conclusion that, um, well, you can see here. So very good, what, what's the percent green? Things that look pretty good in the red tax. You go down in the southeastern part of New York State, there's a lot of red, which means that's a poor likelihood of good regeneration of the species that you have in the canopy. And it's, you know, it's scattered around. There's not a whole lot of trees up here, so that's kind of like a white, white area here. So um, I believe they came to the conclusion that 30% uh, uh, of the, of the uh, forest or those plots um, will regenerate um, not so well. Okay? And you can see that. Now, if you go to desirable soft timber species, it gets worse. Okay, so the desirable saw timber species are things like oak, cherry, maples, etc. Um, what is regenerating well in the overstory is beech. The Adirondacks is a sea of beech. That's in the overstory. It's regenerating very well in the understory. So you say that's sustainable. Now the question is, do you want a sea of beech in the understory? That's, that's a tough one to call. If you don't want to see a beach in the overstory, we're, we're in worse shape, okay? And here, it's more like 70% um, of, the, of the state is doing fair to poor, and very little of the state is doing well when it comes to soft timber species. We just <laughs> at uh, Cornell University where we sent out a survey to active foresters who are out in the woods virtually every day, they're managing forests, they know what's going on with their clients, they know what's going on quite literally in their neck, neck of the woods. And we asked them, so all the stands that you, you're in, in acting, are interacting with, and that should be regenerating, not every stand should be regenerating, it's the ones that the heart, the canopy's been removed, there's plenty of light hitting the forest floor. There should be a jump start. There should be a flush of regeneration coming up. And, and that's the stands we're asking them about. And, and we just use you know, qualifiers like highly successful, moderately successful, mar marginally successful, or complete failure. And statewide, most unfortunately, they are of the opinion that this adds up to 70%. 70% of the stands work regenerating well at all. And 30% statewide work. If you go out to other regions, such as, remember that, all that red down there in the corner of uh, southeast of Catskills, in southeastern New York? That's what this represents here. And that adds up to more like um, 75%. So across the board, across New York State, except in the Adirondacks, uh, regeneration is pretty abysmal. And so you think, you say, why is it? How could that possibly be? Well, we asked the foresters that also. We said, so who would you say or what would you say is causing this failed regeneration of the stands that were either failed or uh, not successful? Let's put it that way. Um, and deer were identified 72% of the time. This doesn't add up to 100 because guess what? All these... Um, interact with each other. So this can't add up to 100, but 72% of the time uh, they said deer were a major factor. 50% of the time they said interfering vegetation, those things that Pete was showing you. And about four of the time they said the landowner just wasn't doing it right. Either didn't know how to do it or wasn't getting the job done because they didn't know soap culture, essentially, or they weren't applying soap culture. So, so deer are a fact. So what's the deer population doing across New York State? Um, well, the only way we would know, the only indicator we would have is how many deer are shot or reported uh, via DEC by, by hunters. And so this is like 2005 here, out to 2011. You can see the harvest is about state. Now, so does this indicate what the deer population is doing? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. It can only indicate where hunting is allowed. There's a lot of land out there that hunting 
isn't allowed. It's either posted, or it's in a neighborhood, or it's too close to houses, or whatever. And there's a lot of land out there that isn't hunted, and so this kind of begs the question, so on the land where hunting isn't allowed, what's that population doing? Is it growing? Is it stable? Is it decreasing? Can you make a wild guess at it? No one shoots those deer. What is it? <laughs> you're, you're killing them. You just get them off season. Get them with your, with your 357 cubic inch. <laughs> so, so looking at um, habitat suitability across New York State, if you look at um, deer like saplings and, and seedlings, you know, that's what they eat. That's what. That's how they make their living, shall we say. And what's the proportion of stands across New York State since 1970 up to 2006? You can see that the saw timber, mature saw timber, that's the white ones there, um, used to be 30%. And as I said in my opening slide, the forests are maturing. Now we're up to 60%, are 12 inches or bigger diameter. Now the ones that the, the habitat the deer or the deer like yes are is this the saplings and seedlings it went absolutely in reverse went from 50 percent down to 20 percent less than 20 percent so across the board is the habitat improving or decreasing for deer across New York State decreasing okay. what's the What's the population doing? Is it going down too? Is it following it where it should follow it? We don't know for sure, but I'm guessing it probably not is not following the habitat. So there's a there's a conflict brewing here. You got too many deer in too little habitat. The habitat is left is going to be hammered. It's going to be pounded by deer to some extent. And that's what those first two or three slides show. Deer are having their way with regeneration, they're largely eliminated. So, and so how is that bad? Well, deer have the ability to essentially eat themselves out of house and home, and when they do that, they impact other wildlife species. You know, you think about a forest that could or should have this lush understory, and if you've got a lot of deer, that lush understory isn't going to be there, it's going to be gone. And anything that relies on a lush understory to make a living, songbirds and some mammals, etc., they're going to be gone because the deer have eliminated that component of the ecosystem. So, in a study in um, Pennsylvania a few years ago, um, they had uh, deer packs, okay? They got large packs, a few hundred acres. And so they had deer at 10 deer per square mile, 20, 40, and 80. And they monitor the number of songbirds in those, in those areas. The more deer you had, well, let's put it this way, yeah, the more deer you had, the fewer songbirds you had. The fewer deer, the more songbirds. So they were impacting another species. And if you look at wildflowers, which would be an indicator of the, of the diversity of the ecosystem, the wildflowers also got hammered. When you go from 10 deer down to 80 deer per square mile, the wildflower species also disappear. So if they really are a player, they impact their own habitat and they impact the habitat of other wildlife. So when it comes to regeneration of hardwoods in New York State, there's three things that, that, that you have, three components to it. One is if you're going to have successful regeneration, um, so culturally, you're going to have to manage that overstory in some manner, in a correct sort of way. And there's different cutting strategies or different regimens of harvesting that overstory that will be either more or less successful to jumpstart the kind of regeneration you're interested in. The other thing you're going to have to do at the same time is control the understory. And I think he talked about that. And so ways of understory. Controlling that could be herbicide, cutting, or even goats. Not very many people are going to get a herd of goats, fence them in, and, and be an animal husbandry all 
through the summer, but it is possible to do it. It just takes a lot of work and effort. And then the third component, of course, is the deer thing. Uh, deer have the ability to really pound that regeneration. And, and the, the kicker is, if you're going to be successful in regenerating, you're going to have to take care of all three of those simultaneously. You take care, you forget or don't do the right thing with any one of these, that alone will sink your boat. So, and, and, and you better do all three of these, I'm just kind of shooting from the hip, about 80% successfully. You only do them 50% successfully, you probably won't like the regeneration you don't get. <laughs> you won't be getting it. So let's talk a little bit about deer and how they, in, I, I had to say something good about deer, so now I'm trying to tell you about you know, what it takes to have a healthy deer, which I'm all for is healthy deer. And uh, so deer are herbivores, and they're ruminants, and they're browsers and grazers. Their feeding zone is up to six feet, and they definitely have food preferences. But what's interesting and really confounding is their food preferences seem to be exactly, almost in lockstep, with our soft timber preferences. <laughs> do you like oak? Or soft timber? Deer do too. Do you like maples? Deer do too. Uh, and on down the line, the only one you might, the only, the only exception to that rule might be black cherry. Although yeah. I think regionally they have their preferences. What's that? They don't eat many cherry. I got too many cherry trees. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's one thing then. But not everybody has, has the privilege of having hardly any cherry to regenerate and start with. But deer probably won't be, won't be bothering you. So, what are some of the facts regarding uh, a deer's diet? Uh, they need six to eight pounds of browse per day if that's all they're going to eat. In the summer, it's going to be uh, mostly greens, leaves, grass, herbaceous plants, etc. In the summer, I'm not telling you, you don't know the fruit, acorns, uh, crops, mushrooms, <coughs> and in the winter, early spring, it's almost all seed. They need. And so it, when they need six to eight pounds, there's 600 seedlings per pound. So it doesn't take very many deer to annihilate those desirable um, sugar maple seedlings out there in your good luck. They also have non-preferred foods. And this is kind of like deer kind of do a high grading of your regeneration. They take the best and they leave the rest. Just like, you know, a, a, a landowner that isn't thinking about the future, deer aren't thinking about the future either because they leave behind beech, striped maple, black cherry, hornbeam, ironwood, and they don't like ferns, so you like up with a fern patch, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they can, they can lead your uh, woodlock regeneration astray. So here's, here's some factoids. Remember I said it takes 600 seedlings per pound. That's 4,200 seedlings per day. That's a million and a half seedlings per year. That's one and a quarter tons of seedlings. One deer, one year. But fortunately, deer, most deer have access to other food sources in the fall and summer. So that's, you know, that's all they have to eat. That's how much, how much they would have to eat. Um, Deer are very selective regarding their, their species, that's all I'm saying there. Deer have their heaviest impact on regeneration in the winter and early spring. Remember that, the first slide I had, that was a fawn going through the woods looking for anything that popped its head above the snow, and if it was edible, that fawn was there to eat it. That's when, that's when they do most of their impacts. Regeneration doesn't escape deer until six feet tall, and you're going to have to have an eight-foot fence, at the very least, in order to keep the deer up. So, uh, deer depend on a variety of foods throughout the season, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is more of a, of a specific talk um, on deer nutrition. So, we don't have to get into all this. Okay, so remember the technique. So, culturally, you've got to do the right thing with the overstory. And what that really is, you're adjusting the light in the understory. And the overstory is your source of seeds. So you gotta have the right kind of seeds in the overstory and have it on the on the under in the understory uh, to regenerate <coughs> to turn into seedlings. And you gotta control the understory if a, if a bad understory species. 
and then you got control of the gear. So once again, I do all three of these, and that's a theme I'm going to be coming to time and time again. So let's take a drive around New York State. This is my favorite part. Actually, New York State's not even near as bad as Pennsylvania. When I go to Pennsylvania, I always have to have a camera because I can just fill this slideshow right full. It's great. Most of these came from Pennsylvania. Uh, although that one came from the Arnott Forest, which is that uh, Cornell manages. That was years ago. We don't have this problem anymore. And I'll tell you more about that later. Uh, so this is a harvest where we opened up the canopy. So silviculturally, we did the right thing. Here's some, some of that luscious sunlight hitting the forest floor. We're hoping for, and we got a nice maple tree here, sugar maple. We want that to cast some seed. We want some nice sugar maple regeneration. And why didn't it happen? It happened where there weren't no deer here, inside the fence, but it didn't happen on the outside. And, and deer were the fact. There were no, there's no, form, no, hardly any ferns. You can't say it was the understory. You can't say we didn't do the right thing so culturally, but you can't say we weren't handling the deer correctly. That's an example of you, you do everything right, you don't take care of the deer, you're going to be a loser. How did, how but that, I, was, that I, was 15 years ago at the RNR. Yes? How big a patch would that have been with, with the fencing around it? Oh, that's uh, 15 meters by 15 meters, or 10 meters by 10 meters. And is there a screen over the top of no, the patch? No, no, that's just like four or five feet tall. I see. Deer don't like to jump into. They, they can certainly jump in there, but they don't like to jump into little exclusions. That's how you can get away with, you know, small patches like that. Okay. Yep. So you know you're in trouble when you go out through your woods and you're looking at the regeneration. This is a white ash that probably is about 10 years old and it's still about two and a half feet tall. Because it just gets broomed, it gets hammered. You can see it gets browsed every year. It probably would never escape here. Okay. You know you're in trouble if you cut down a beach and, and the deer come along and annihilate the sprouts of the beach. How do you know you're in trouble? How come you know you're in trouble? They don't like They don't like beach. <laughs> uh oh. That's all I can say. Uh oh. This is a patch clear cut, which is a legitimate <coughs> cultural treatment that has promise and has, you know, that's doing the right thing so culturally. Um, this landowner, this is in Pennsylvania, is a small small patch clear cut, I'll give you that. I mean, it's too small. But, you know, that's a nice uh, red maple to seed in, you know, and it's nicely opened up, cut out some bad trees, and there's lots of sunlight, you know, the stage is set for regeneration. So, so culturally, did, they did the right thing. What two things didn't they do right? Remember the three things you got to do at the same time? Okay. The deer, I don't know about the deer, but it is Pennsylvania, so I'm just assuming there's too many deer. Um, but how about the understory? That sea of hasten and ferns is like permanent at this point. That, that's a, a you know, mat this deep with roots and, and uh, rhizomes and stuff. And nothing can, can you know, a, a seedling tries to get established here and it won't get enough light, nor can it even touch the forest floor. It can't touch dirt. It can't touch dirt. It can't grow. And if it did grow and, and one popped out of the ground here, what would happen to it? Deer would come along and with it. So. You know you're in trouble if you have a strip clear cut, which is another legitimate forestry technique, some cultural technique. And this is down in the Catskills in Sullivan County. And this is a uh, four acre strip clear cut and and so culturally what we're hoping uh, actually this isn't my stand this is uh, Frost Valley YMCA camp and what the forester was hoping for is open up the canopy get all this sunlight the seeds will, will sprinkle in from afar they'll hit the dirt there's no understory everything should work out just perfect and four years later where's the under where's the regeneration Four, and four years, you got to have some. Yeah. You got it. Otherwise, what? Where did it all go? Yeah. Deer. Deer. And you say, well, boy, deer herd must be, you know, must be forty deer per square mile. No, there's probably about eight deer per square mile. 
It doesn't take very many deer when they have nothing else to eat. That is a food plot. A food plot in the middle of the woods. And, and in four years' time, nothing green has escaped. And, and that's just on a few deer. You know, they don't have very many deer, but they got way too many deer. That habitat can't support hardly any deer, obviously. This is a, uh, a Scott pine plantation in the Tug Hill. And uh, I know a fellow planted it, and for the first three years, the deer left his scotch pines alone, and on year three, they decided, I guess I like scotch pine after all. And they annihilated this Christmas tree plantation. Oh. And it took them one winter, and they just told them. Oh, yeah. Hold on just, hold on just a second here. Uh, you know your trouble when you do a timber harvest, and this sea of beech brush comes back? I think Peter told, showed you this. You know you're in trouble when you drive down the driveway <laughs> and those are your uh, Harbor Mighty or White Cedars. Deer love White Cedar, obviously. It's the way they're supposed to look. What's that? It's not the way they're supposed to look. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> the deer, so this is you know roughly five, six feet tall here, and the deer come along and nibble it all off. All right. Well, I guess it saves you the problem of pruning them. You don't have to prune them, the deer can do the pruning for you. Not right. Well, so some of them have well, some of them have escaped, some of them haven't. This poor guy here is going to be virtually <laughs> dead. So you know you're trolling, you drive down the road, and you see a six foot um, tall browse line. They call this a browse line. So this is six foot tall. And these are all sugar maples in the overstory, which is wonderful. And, and, and that overstory is so dark and so dense. You would never really expect to see anything in every story anyway. You just wouldn't. I mean, that's, not, that's okay. You wouldn't see it in there. But on the other hand, if you did decide, well, it's time to cut the stand, it's time to regenerate, how do you think that's going to turn out? I think there's going to be a problem. And the problem is going to be that deer. And the rest of it. You're also in trouble when you drive down the road. This is your neighbor's because neighbor has a browse line and the neighbor doesn't like hunting. So you've got a problem. If you're interested in regeneration, your neighbor is your problem. So what does it take to get regeneration going? A lot of things. What can you control? You can control sunlight because you can do it so culturally the right thing and you can control those invasives and hopefully you can control the deer. Those are those three factors again. So what deer management options do you have? You can put repellents on anything within reach of a deer, but that'll get old if you've got a few, a few thousand seedlings you're trying to protect. You, you can protect a few things on your lawn, but you can't protect acres and acres of regeneration. You can put up fencing, uh, you can do individual tree protection, and I'll go through these real quick here in a minute. You can increase the harvest of female deer, essentially knock the, knock the herd back and reproductive potential of that herd. And then I just throw this in for the fun of it, encourage natural predation. So you have coyotes, black bears, petition DEC to reintroduce mountain lions and bulls. You can do that. I'm not saying we're going to get very far, but you can petition them. Uh, that's really just a joke, obviously. Under, under that last one, I'm going to call the joke. Would you include hunting? Well, uh, the hunting here is here. Increased right. harvest of female. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. You're that, that's the big one. If you're going to put a star next to something, that would give you the biggest bang for your buck. Yes. The other thing, when you showed that, I think you called it the YMCA camp or something like that. Yeah. I was thinking about leaving your slash high. Yes. Helps prevent. And, and I'll be there in just a minute. Great. Yep. Okay, thank you. Yep. You're absolutely right. That's a hugely important thing to do. So, fencing, it costs money. Um, cost time and money, and money is time, etc., etc. Um, so if you fenced off 10 acres, it will cost you $400 per acre. If, you fence, if there's a, a law of diminishing returns, you fence 50 acres, it's only going to cost you $200 an acre. But that's an investment. So you know, I do a harvest, I fence it off because I want regeneration. That's a, that, that will work if you've got the time and money to do it right. 
The question is, so when am I going to get that $200 an acre back? When is that coming back into my pocket? How, how long do you have to wait? Uh, two generations. Uh, two generations. A generation of what? Of, of, of your, your descendants. Okay. So, I mean, it could easily be 60 years before you get, you know, any cash back out of that effort, which is too long to wait. <laughs> Trees are a slow crop. They're, they're a valuable crop, but they grow very slow. You put up a nice fence like that, well, that's going to cost you more, more than $1.50 a foot. So, let's talk more about deer biology now. In a healthy ecosystem, deer really can uh, repopulate very quickly. And so this is just a simple, it, it's too simple, but it is, it, it is accurate enough. It gives you the impression of deer have the ability to reproduce a lot like rabbits. You know, they, you say, well, gee, they only have two fawns a year, and this is a male female. There's the two fawns. So you go, you're one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. By year seven, we're up to 40 deer. That's, and, and that's a one-to-one -one sex ratio. What's the real sex ratio out there, more typically? Is there, is there a mature buck for every mature doe out there? Well, it's probably a mature buck for every three mature does. So this, you know, those three mature does are all having fawns. This simple rule of thumb, 50%, could be more like 70%, provided there's no other mortality. Now, there is other mortality. You know, there's coyotes and dogs and disease and accidents and cars and things like that. But generally speaking, 50% of the has <coughs> either got to leave or die every year so the population remains stable. A lot of mature does have twins. Yeah, well, yeah, and, and that's what, these guys are having twins. In, in here, they do have twins. I mean, that's this simple little diagram. Here's a twin. So the does have twins. Some do, some don't, some have triplets. So, so how does it play out in the woods? Okay, we're talking about deer in a forested environment. So what I'm showing you here is this big bubble is a managed forest. It's very diverse. It has lots of food opportunities. There's sunlight hitting the forest floor. There's regeneration coming up. You know, it's a pretty nice environment for deer. And, and so you're saying, well, I'm interested in producing um, as many deer per square mile per year as possible. So that's the net productivity. So as your population goes down to like 30 deer in a managed forest, 30 deer per square mile in a managed forest will give you maximum productivity Okay, you get more 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 fawns born per year, and if you're a hunting club, that's where you want to be. I would think, right? I want as many targets every fall as possible. That's why my hunters are there. That's why they're paying good bucks for that for that uh, privilege. On the other hand, if you have an unmanaged forest, there's less forest uh, forage, less regeneration available, and that bubble is tiny. You get to 15 deer per square mile, and it would be maxed out at that point. So it's just you know the health of that ecosystem. You're further ahead to have a managed, healthy ecosystem, even if you're growing deer. And so what does this look like on the land? So there's a healthy, really productive deer habitat. And, and that's taken from Route 86 out in Allegheny County. And and what are you looking at? You're thinking, so what does a deer need to make the go of it? It needs some crops, that's good. It needs some grasses, that's good. It needs some browse. This forest up here was like clear cut. See that? It needs some mature woods. Uh, you probably could use a pine plantation somewhere, but in general, that's a pretty productive, healthy deer ecosystem. And they certainly probably have 40 deer per square mile. And really, it isn't too bad a situation. <coughs> Okay. And, and you go out to Allegheny, Chautauqua, those counties out there, and they have some of the highest buck takes or some of the highest uh, harvests of deer in New York State. But that, that country out there can sustain it because they have, they have that ability. Okay. So let's look at 
the little bubble here. So we just look at this one. Let's look at this little bubble. This is that little bubble. An unmanaged forest. So if you're a deer, where are you going to get your next meal? There's nothing there. Absolutely nothing. There's a couple little ferns here. And, 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 and that's all like beach right there. That's a, a cherry. But there's almost nothing in the understory in that first five, six feet for a deer to eat. So how, how many, what does it take to, so how many, what's the carrying capacity of, of that land? If the other carrying capacity was 40 per square mile, how many deer per square mile can that have? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it's any. I don't know what deer would It's got to go somewhere other than there to get a, get a mouthful of food. Is that woods what you're looking at? Is that dead timber? Yeah, it's an old dead timber laying there. You know? And what this is, actually, this was sawn. Right there, that is sawn. Because I'm standing on a brand new road. And, and some of the material is pushed off in there. That essentially is forever wild area of the Casco. No forest management there whatsoever, nor is it allowed to have forest management there. And, and for, as far as deer habitat is concerned, pretty abysmal. This is that same area down the Frost Valley YMC, YMCA camp, and this is a 35 acre clear cut over here. Once again, a clear cut is a wonderful way to regenerate um, a lot of species, provided there isn't competition from undesirables or deer. This is inside the fence. This is eight feet tall. This is outside the fence. Remember that four-acre strip clear cut that didn't have any regeneration? This is this is the exact same one, but it's very close to this area. So for the next umpteen years, nothing of any value will ever grow there because the deer are not at all. So this is three years old. There's an absolute sea of regeneration in there. There's stuff in there that's three years old, it's 12 feet tall. A lot of those are stump sprouts, you know, they really can take off, but, but that's how old it is. So here, so now we're all deer biologists, right? So we're going to analyze this from a deer biologist or from a silvicultural standpoint. Which one has successfully regenerated? Which side of the fence? Right, right side. Okay. And, and that looks pretty darn encouraging. Remember that little shot I had at the Arnott Forest, all those, all those seedlings and saplings? And so, this is an exposure on this side, and this is the wide open world over here. And what do you see there that would indicate that deer may, there may be too many deer over there? What, what, what are we looking for? You know you're in trouble when? High grouse line. You see grouse line. And what, what's in the other story? Ferns. Ferns and Ferns. sedges. You know? Deer don't like sedges. So, how many deer per square mile do you think are on this side of the fence, on the left hand side? No, who, who knows? I can tell you one thing, it's too many. It's too many. If you're interested in regeneration, that place won't support hardly any deer and it'll never support any regeneration. That is an abysmal, wasted ecosystem as far as a healthy, forested ecosystem is concerned. Right. I mean, yeah. if, so you, if you lease this land, look, lease this land over here, go this way, uh, as a hunt club, what would be your number one complaint if you lease that for deer hunting? No deer. No deer. What do you want? What do you want? You want more deer? How are you going to get more deer? Cut down the fence. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> so, so when you go to when you go to DEC and you say DEC, you know, down there in the Catskills, you know, in the high high reaches of Catskills, you go out through there and you're looking at land like that, and you're saying, all right, this this bird is abysmally managed because there's no deer here, what's DEC's option? What's your option? Do you, if you own that land, what's your option? You're way back in the corner. You're painted way back in the corner. You're going to have to do something really drastic to get anything good to happen. And I can't even begin to tell you that, but I could. Go on here. So, you can also put up tubes. This is Dale Schaefer, MFO. Who, uh, mass forest owner, who did a, a saw timber harvest and he had some, some oak regeneration, just a few scattered around, and he put tube around a few of them so that he could at least hold on to those few uh, oak seedlings. 
You can put in a whole plantation of them if you wanted to. They're primarily there to keep deer off. So what are your silvicultural options? Um, the goal is to create conditions, successful regeneration, and growth this evening beyond the reach of deer. That means like five or six feet tall. So be realistic about advanced regeneration. Just because you see a bunch of seedlings and saplings that are knee high in the woods, they may never escape deer. Probably if they're locked into that distance, that height, that probably means the deer won't let them escape. Um, when you do a regeneration harvest of some sort, you know, have a forester, have a have a, a subcultural regime in mind, and it could be a seed tree cut, a shelter wood, a clear cut. But generally speaking, you want to be like go for the gusto. Be somewhat aggressive and somewhat large scale. Otherwise, that strip clear cut, four acres strip clear cut, what did that amount to? It's a good idea, but it should have been 40 acres or 400 acres, or even better yet, it should have been 4,000 acres. And it would have overwhelmed the deer. You mean the lack of food would have overwhelmed the deer? Right. I miss it. Oh, so you cut 4,000 acres. Right. And, and, and five deer per square mile right. aren't going to be able to control that. They can control four acres at a clip, but they can't control, say, 400 acres. At a when, the, when, when, when they call up their buddies and have yeah. them? Well, they, there just isn't that many deer to, to come over. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Right. I mean, per square mile, if there's only eight or ten deer, you close up 400 <coughs> acres, you probably can overwhelm the deer for the four or five years it'll take those seedlings to get high enough. I mean, that, that's a thought. That's a possibility. What's that called again? Well, well I would like to clear it up. Or oh, just a, just a, what you call so, it? Well, so culturally, you've got to come up with a, with a regeneration harvest scheme of some sort with your forester that will be a win. You want to come up with a winning effort, not a losing effort. Well, i got to ask a question then. If you had the left side of that last right. fence, yep. isn't that because the deer can't get at anything, isn't that the same effect? Food-wise, as a clear cut, yeah, that thing. Yeah. After um, a while, they if they if they totally demolish. The, the well, this, this isn't clear cut. This is essentially no. clear cut over here. So. Right, but this I'm saying deer, I'm deer are controlling this area. Right, deer are not controlling this. Area. But yeah, don't they ruin their? Don't they ruin the land on the left? Yeah, hand I side? said I said that already. There are keystone species that have the ability to control their own environment. But isn't and wreck the environment of other animals. But isn't that the same as a clear cut? Well, not, of, not quite because there still is a canopy here. So, yeah, they can't. Yeah, what would I do here? Yeah. You got to shoot all the deer over here. Right. 90% 90 of them get okay. the bigger deer out of there. Okay. And do a clear cut. <laughs> and then, or, or leave a few seed trees to sprinkle some seed in. Oh, okay. To get you, something you need that. Okay, You're locked into an abysmal situation yes, at this point. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we have to do. Yeah. 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 Y
And if you had that done to your wood lot, what would you say? Is that beautiful or dog ugly? Uh, just like crap. It all depends on what you want. What, what's your goal here? You didn't have much before. I wish I had a picture before because it wasn't much either. Other than at least they had some trees standing. Now they don't have any trees standing. But the goal here was to regenerate that stand. And so, so culturally, good idea. This was good. Leave these behind, excellent. So how did it turn out? And what else were we doing at the same time? We were doing the Earn a Buck at the Art Out program, where every hunter there has to shoot two does before they have the privilege of shooting a buck. Okay? And so we were pounding the doe herd into submission. So we were doing everything right. And the understory, remember? So, and there's almost nothing bad in the understory. So that's good. So it looks to me like, so culturally we did the right thing, we're pounding the deer herd, and we, we got a get out of jail free card on the understory. There isn't anything <laughs> bad. So if there had been, we would have herbicided it or, or done something. So this is like three years later. Those, there's your tops. Remember all those tops? There's a whole bunch of sugar maples. Boy, this is looking good. The only trouble is, how come they haven't escaped the tops? Deer. Okay, so at this point, I'm thinking, oh, I don't know. I don't know if we're going to make this or not. But we're still pounding the Dover. So there's a whole bunch of other story scenes. That's, you know, you could be, you could be hopeful at this point. There's a lot of nice species there, and there's a lot of nice density, but they're not six feet tall. Ooh, there's a sea of sugar maple that's up to your waist. How are you feeling about it now? Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. looking good. Have they escaped deer yet? Mm -hmm. Not yet, but there's so many of them, and they've got some got to escape the deer, right? And sure enough, uh, 12 years later, that's that same stand. These are now 15 feet tall. And it's just a sea of sugar maple, red maple, ash, there's oak, there's cherry. If there's more regeneration there than you shake a stick. Too much competition. It, well, well, I'll go with this anytime I can get <laughs> So I'm going to like, quite literally, I'm going to let God sort of that. Let the winners decide who they're going to be over the next few years. But that's a wonderful situation. And that, that, that's at the R-Not. That's 10 years into earn month. So 10 years later, we've had the herd in this. And so, that was no offense, right? Uh, there was no offense there. No, that's the real world. So quality gear management is a, is kind of a version of what we're doing in here. And so there's our policy: shoot two female deer before they shoot a buck. Hunters have to sign in and out. They use VMAPs, VMC. VMAPs are extra doe tags given to landowners or their hunters. So there's the harvest. At the Arna. So pre Arnabuck, this is what we were shooting. We were shooting about 30 deer a year, and we were shooting more adult bucks that year. We shot more adult, adult does then. We shot almost no fawns. The hunters were running the show at the Arna. They were taking what they wanted. Guess what? When you go deer hunting, don't you want to run the show? You want to shoot bucks? Yeah, who wants to shoot a fawn? You know, I don't need to fill all my doe tags. You know, very casual. All our hunters were very casual about doing our work for us. Guess what? When we said, nope, new rules, guys. You guys shoot two does, prove it to us before you can shoot a buck. Guess what happened then? There's some serious doe shooting. Doe, 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 doe. We shot, shot off the doe herd. And okay. very okay. few bucks were being shot, at least initially. And so 12 years later, where are we? It's interesting. We have probably a quarter of the deer we used to have, and we're right back, right where we were hunting before. We shoot 30 deer a year. We get a fair number of does. We get a few bucks. We get some very nice bucks, oh, by the way. And so when it was all said and done, we, we had our cake, and we're eating it, too. We could grow trees at the are not. The harvest is almost identical to what it was before the Interbuck program, and there's a lot fewer deer. So, how many acres? 4,000 acres. And it's about how many acres it takes to make something like this happen. If you only have 300 acres, you're just doing your, your neighbors' service. 
How do you enforce this and could you do it on private land? Uh, we enforce it because we have a gate. It's not fenced, but you have to come in, you have to sign in, sign out. We know who you are, they know who we are, we are et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You, you just have to, you have to be able to be in control of your hunters in some manner. Okay, that's the end of the talk. Not doing too bad, we've had a little bit of time. Okay, so I can take a few questions. I've ha had your questions, I'll, I'll be back to you. Yeah, I'll talk to you later. Yeah. How did you go about getting the extra uh, Those are all DMAPs. We, we asked the local, regional DEC wildlife biologists to send us a pile of them. And we get like 50 a year. Now we're down to about, we don't need many now, so we only get about 30 a year. Do you have to have a management plan? Well, they for, for deer harvest. You have to. I don't know if you have a written management plan. You have to show a sincere interest and ability and a story of some sort that you're out there trying to make good things happen. And, and I'll just leave it at that. Every every DEC office will take a different approach. We got to be sincere. Statewide, is there a trend for fewer deer or fewer hunter? Oh, statewide? I, I think we're holding our own currently. It's about stable. It, it has decreased greatly since like 1980. Now we're down by like, like three quarters of, of the number of deer hunters we used to have in 1980. But I think it's plateaued. And it's at like three three quarters of a million, or no, 600,000 deer hunters statewide. It used to be a million. Any other questions? Oh, I have a, so if you're interested in some literature or websites or more reading about deer management and regeneration, I've got, I've got a handout that's probably got 25 different websites and books and articles and things that you may find quite interesting. So I'll leave those up. Gary, thank yes. you very, very much.